Good morning, New Holland. Thanks for coming to God's house today. This was found in the parking lot last week. Golden Age Passport, a lifetime admissions permit. I have no idea what this is, but I was given it. So if this is yours, amen. If it's not, we're going to throw it away. <laughs> uh, a lifetime admission permit. Is this what you get when you get saved, Mark? I don't know. A Golden Age Passport. Well, it says non-transferable, so it's for you and for you alone. It does sound a little bit like salvation, doesn't it? Amen. I get a sermon out of anything. Thanks for coming to God's house today. You have your Bible turned to uh, Matthew 28. I want to thank all of those who came last week. We had fun. Um, really didn't know if we were going to have bumper cars in the parking lot, but God warmed it up, and we had a nice, clean parking lot, and had a really, really special spirit yes, last Sunday. I just thought it was uh, so, uh, I don't know what it was. It made me want to just have Sunday afternoon services every week. It was so sweet. But um, I, I like what we do. I thank you for what you do, New Holland. I thank you for your love for the Lord, for seeking to put God first. And uh, for the next 30 minutes, let's just put our focus on what it means to be a disciple of Christ. If you're joining us and you haven't been around us a while, we're looking at our five core values at New Holland. I'm not sure how long, there, we've had two mission statements that I know of, and I don't know what the, the earliest one was dated, but it was uh, redone to a certain extent, but, but basically they say the same thing, and it's uh, the thing that all of us agree. We've talked about our high five, and um, I'm amazed at how well you're learning these, you're remembering them, and that was my hope, was to do the high five so that you could remember them. One, we point toward God. We want to know that we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So number one is worship. Worship God. Number two, we're at peace with our brother. We're supposed to love our brother as much as we love ourself, and that's fellowship. So number two is fellowship. Three, think of the three crosses. And on the center of those three crosses was Jesus Christ dying for the sins of the world. On one side was one that received. On the other side was one that did not receive. So three is evangelism. Always see it in that way. Four, we think of the four quadrants of the heart. That's what makes us beat. If your heart stops beating, you will die. That is discipleship. A church that doesn't disciple will die. A church member that is not growing in the likeness of Christ, what purpose? You're dead. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. What are, we are supposed to grow up and be like God. Number five, we're supposed to lend a hand to someone else that service. Someone asked me, said, what does the thumbs up mean? That means if you see someone doing service, give them a thumbs up. That's number five. So today, last Sunday, I was going to preach this. But since we did it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, by the way, we had 89 here last Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. That's pretty good because none of us really knew if we were going to have icy steps or what you were going to travel on the way here. Uh, when I got up uh, last Sunday morning, it was 27 degrees. By 11.15, it was uh, still 31 degrees, and we had two inches of snow. Uh, by uh, 1.30, when we left the house, it was gone. It was just an amazing day, but we didn't know what it was going to be like, so I appreciate all of you who get, got up to come. But today, we're going to talk our second in the, on discipleship. That's number four, and we're going to find that in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, God gives us the great commission not the good commission the great commission and if it was great that he put it in front of us we should live it with all of our heart so mind and strength so if you would with me stand up in honor of reading God's word Jesus came and spoke to them verse 18 saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, uh, this is your day, your day. We've separated every day into you. But Lord, when we gather together with the church, that's a special thing. So Father, speak to us personally. I don't know how you do it, but by your Holy Spirit, draw us close. Father, if we come and just meet, 
we, we will leave without being changed. But Lord, if you will interrupt this service with your power and your presence and your goodness, the, the spirit that draws us together, we will leave with a smile on our face, with a conviction in our heart, with a desire to serve you, to bow before you, to praise you, O oh God. We will decide that, that you have a, a work that you want to do in our life, a commission that you have sent us unto, and we will take that seriously. And Father, the world will be different because we will be different. So Father, in the next minutes that are ahead, just draw us close, put your arms around us. Father, may we not hear from a person <clears throat> but may the word come alive. Father, may we be challenged by what we haven't done. Maybe we, may we be challenged to do what we should do. And Father, all for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> he says, verse 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Now, he's the creator of all. And he put this life together for us. We've been given life and we chose to go our own way. It happened, it began in the Garden of Eden. But it's been happening ever since then. Before the flood, it said these words, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. God punished that. Because what they did in their own eyes was sin. Matter of fact, only a small group sought God and that's a shame with all the things that God has given us you think that we would honor him more but let me just say to you that to a great extent even today people come to God and they they, they face God they listen to God they worship God they yield their life into God simply in pretty much in the same way they do what is right in their own eyes. Can I just say, we need to be challenged beyond that. I want to be challenged. Beyond, I want to live a life bigger than me. I want to live a life for a greater goal than just for me. I want to be useful. I, I read a book <clears throat> about 17, 18 years ago now, Bob Buford wrote, called Halftime. And he said, in the first half of your life, you're seeking success. But he said, in the second half of your life, you're seeking significance. In other words, what are you going to do with what God's given you? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to use that only for yourself? We're here today because we want more. We want to live our life for the glory and the honor of God. Jesus says, this is the author and the creator of life. This is the one who came and, and died on the cross. On the cross of Calvary he may have come meek and mild but he, he he yielded his life but when he was resurrected he was resurrected as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord his life was the essence of the good news the gospel and we are now believers and we're supposed to be followers of him so when he says all authority is given to him we need to walk we need to understand we live under that authority So that means what Brian thinks really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you give me a title of senior pastor. That really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long I've been in the pulpit. It doesn't matter what my degrees are. It doesn't matter uh, all the things, all the books that I've read. It doesn't matter all that I've tried to do in serving the Lord. It really doesn't matter. What matters is what he says. And it matters how I'm connected with him in doing everything that he's called me to do. I can't do it myself. I'm not good enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not strong enough. And we can all amen that. But God called us to a commission, and he said all authority has been given to, to him. And if we join in that authority, please hear this, or you're going to miss everything else then everything God called us to do, he'll empower. So really, for everything else that I'm going to say for the rest of this message, as we look at God's word and what God's called us to, you need to understand as long as we're doing his will and his strength, his way, he'll empower. We just have to agree with it. 
We have to be one with that. So look what he says in verse 19. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. This is our calling. Our calling is to do something, not learn something. As a learner, and that's what literally the word disciple means. Go make disciples. We are to be learners and we're go make learners. Look what he says in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I've, I've commanded you. He said, a disciple is a learner. You're to go make others. Uh, that means baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They've got to come know Jesus Christ, the personal Savior and Lord. Salvation begins at all, but that's not where it ends. It doesn't end at salvation. It begins at salvation. And we're to be a learner for the rest of our days. But a learner not in just taking information, but living it. Living it. We are to do it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He is the greatest preacher of truth the world's ever known, but he chose 12 disciples to disciple them so that they could go out and replicate themselves. He sent out the 12. He raised his hands. He ascended back to glory. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, right where he should be. But he left us to do the job that he began. He completed his part, but it's our job to continue it on. So millennium after millennium, century after century, generation after generation, year after year, day after day, we are to be about the master's business. Jesus came to forgive sins, to call people into a relationship. And that once we are saved and part of that relationship, we are to do the works of Christ. That's discipleship. Now, there's some things about this that I call false assumptions about what it means to be a discipleship. Here are four. Y'all listen? Number one, it happens at salvation. It doesn't hap it didn't happen at salvation, it begins at salvation. Salvation is defined in and of itself, receiving Jesus Christ and, and, and the gift of that. You repent of your sins, repent of your sins. Acknowledge him and know that he is the only one who can save you. He's the one that paid the price on the cross of Calvary. He's the one that can, can de he defeated sin and death. And you give your heart and life to him. A saved person is one that is forgiven but it is one whose life is now connected with him to live the life of Christ on this earth for the remainder of your days. But it doesn't end at salvation. That's a false assumption. It simply begins at salvation. It's not done. If it were done, he would have saved me as a 10-year-old kid when I prayed that prayer, and he'd have taken me to heaven because I wouldn't have had to put up with all this sin anymore. It would, all life would be would just be getting saved, getting saved. No, he wants you to get saved. I'm going to say it again. He wants you to get saved. But what are you going to do with your salvation? What are, you, are you going to, do you love him enough not just to give him your heart? Do you love him enough to give him your life? The second false assumption. It just happens naturally over time. Let me get quicker in this. The third false assumption. It is achieved largely by simply an act of your will. You're going to be a disciple by choosing it and just doing it. You, you, you say, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to do this. Number four, it's accomplished alone. These are false assumptions that are propagated by Satan himself. I'm going to say them a different way. Salvation plus time plus choosing it, your will, plus just the individual work in you equals life change. Listen to your pastor real plainly. Hogwash. I don't mean that rudely. Just call a lie a lie. If this is all that it took 
getting saved, having some time, choosing to do. I, I, how many of you have made promises to God? How many of you facing temptation said, I'm not going to do that? I'm not going to do that. And yet you did. And then you just said, well, I can do it by myself. I don't need any help. I, I, it's just God saved me. I can just do it on my own. And we think we're going to change something. I, I've been studying this for quite a while. And I know that this is the hardest of the five for me to convey. And I'm going to, because these false assumptions are just very natural for us. We fall into them very easily. And church, we don't like being challenged on those things. So I'm just going to share these things the best I know how. And I want you to have an open mind to hearing what I'm saying. The first false assumption is it happens at salvation. I've already said it once. No, that's just where it begins. That's where it begins. I remember uh, when I was a kid, there was a comedian. He was from Russia. And he, came, he was hilarious. He was a little bitty thing, fuzzy-headed kind of guy. His name was Yakov Smirnov. And he said when he came to America, he went to the grocery store, and, and he walked in, and he found pad, powdered milk. And he said, what a wonderful country. He said, just add water, and you have milk. Then he found tang, powdered orange juice. Just add water to it, and boom, you've got orange juice. He said, what a wonderful country. Then he found baby powder. <laughs> what a wonderful country. Uh, how many of you know it takes a little bit more than that? Amen? <laughs> and it just begins when they're born into this world. When a... I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. When Lynn was uh, pregnant with Jay, she, she had to figure out how she was going to tell me. So she uh, uh, gave me a children's book, stories about the Bible in it. And uh, she gave it to me, and I said, well, that's very nice. She said, read the front cover. So I opened it up, and I read it, and I said, that's sweet. She said, read it again. <laughs> I read it again. And it said, upon the announcement of our birth of our first child and I'm like I think if I'm not mistaken you had to tell me to read it three times is that right <laughs> just twice well I amen I'm not as dumb as I thought it was <laughs> I finally looked up at her and I said really now I'm still a parent amen I'm still a parent um, and it I have found out that um, getting them to 18 is not the ending point it, it, it continues on some of y'all have been doing it a lot longer than I have. But, but, but I understand this, that, that it may begin having the child, but it doesn't end there. It keeps going and going and going. I, I'm going to say this again. It doesn't end at salvation. It begins at salvation. People talk about the Apostle Paul on the uh, Damascus Road, and he got saved and he went in and, Man, he just changed his life. But what they forget is that uh, he, 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 his first chance at living this new life got him in trouble at Damascus. Galatians tells us he went out in the wilderness and he spent three years with the Word of God studying in the wilderness. Now, this is somebody who had already been studying his whole life. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a learned man. But now he had to kind of unlearn a few things and have a fresh look at the Word of God. Then when he came back to, to Damascus, he thought, hey, man, it's going to work now. He's been to seminary of the desert. Well, no. They, they literally had to put him in a basket and, and lower him down uh, through a window or they were going to kill that man. He went to Jerusalem so he could join with the disciples. They said, we don't want anything with that guy. Praise God, there was a guy by the name of Barnabas who became a mentor to Paul, Saul at that point in time. And, and, and he defended him and he worked with him. Well, then that was a good thing. No, that, the apostles at, at, at Jerusalem sent 
him home to Tarsus, literally sent him home to mom. Later on, Barnabas once again invited him to come to a new work that was happening at Antioch. Listen to me, church. 14 years from the Damascus Road experience till God began to use Paul in ministry. And then, it wasn't the greatest thing in the world. I mean, his first missionary journey, they stoned him and left him for dead. Was that the end? No, it was learning experiences. As a matter of fact, Paul was a man who made great failures, but he learned from his failures. Anybody in here ever failed? Do you think God allowed that? Do you think God wants to learn, teach you something where you can learn something to where you can apply it in your life? How many of you are still making mistakes? How many of you are still learning from those mistakes? I pray. You see, we're, it's, it, it only begins at salvation, but now what are you going to do with it? It continues, it continues on. The second of false assumption was it just continues naturally over time. That's kind of stupid. I don't mean that rudely, but I, let me explain this. How many of y'all have ever played golf? Darryl, you're a golfer. Some of y'all played golf? I, I began playing golf when I was 10 years old. I found out it was a way that my parents could go to work in the summertime and I could be babysat. They'd pay me, and I'd, I played a nine-hole course, and I could stay out there all day long, and they'd pick me up in the afternoon and take me home. And I'd just beat balls into the ground. And, and you think you'd be all right at it, but you see, I was also a baseball player. And I won't tell you that the baseball swing and the golf swings two totally different things. In a baseball, I had a very powerful grip, and I was a dead pull hitter. But in golf, you have to have a very neutral grip. So just going out there and doing it didn't make me a golfer. And then I started studying it, and I learned uh, everything is rhythm and balance, and I learned how to I learned a little bit better at it, and I got a little bit better at it. And I got around smart people, and I read Ben Hogan's book, and you think I'd get good at it. Well, no, not really. No, not really. But I kept playing at it, and I got better. I got coached up a little bit, and I got better. But then, <clears throat> you know, I found out also that um, just playing it a long time doesn't mean you get good at it. Someone said it was a... It was a game that could be easily played but never perfected. Sounds like the Christian life, doesn't it? You, you never get, have, some of y'all who've been Christians for a long time, do temptations still bother you? Are you still vulnerable every day to sin? So is time alone going to make it happen? Are you going to grow in the likeness of Christ simply because you spent a lot of time doing it? Look, you can take a seed, and you can put a seed on a shelf someplace. Come back 30 years later, you know what you're going to find? After you dust it off, you're going to find a seed right there. But that seed has to be buried into the dirt to where that outer shell will deteriorate and break. And then something that happens that only God can do, life can come from that, and it can grow. And it pushes through the dirt. And it's just a little bitty sprout. Is it done? Oh, no, it's just getting started. Until the lifetime is completed. And by the way, most of the fruit comes in the latter years. How many of y'all know Moses didn't get started till he was 80, Bradley? <laughs> y'all think I'm just being funny. A week from Thursday, on 02202020, he'll be 80. And if you have a burning bush, call me. I want to be there. I want to be there. Look, you have to learn intentionally. It doesn't just happen over time. You've got to push yourself. When I said to you it doesn't come naturally, we like to coast. I have a friend of mine in ministry. I love him to death. He's been preaching now over 40 years, close to 45 years. He has been going to school for 45 years. He has three doctorates. He's actually teaching at Piedmont and at uh, New Orleans Theological Seminary. He's an adjunct professor at New Orleans. 
It just makes me tired just thinking about it. But he understands that for, listen to me now, for the uniqueness of what God has made him, for the remainder of his life, he's going to be a learner and a teacher. And he's very good at it. He's very good at it. It's not time. Not time alone. It's being intentional. Number three, it's just an act of changing your will. There's a lot of things I will to do. I can't do it. Talk about golf. I will to break par. I think I've played about five times in the last four or five years. Last year, we had the golf tournament and brought us, invited me to go. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to go play. I got out my clubs and uh, I thought, you know, it'd be nice to go hit balls before. So I went and I hit balls down at Chicopee and they said, hey, why don't you just play? I thought, well, amen, I'll try it. And I was relaxed and I met a guy I had never met before and he was a nice guy and I played with him and I actually did all right. I thought, hey, this is easy. Two days later, I went and played with 80, almost 80-year-old back there and brought us and, and Jacob. I played the worst round of golf I've played in probably 30, 40 years. You know, it's all rhythm and balance, and I'd had no rhythm. And I was way out of balance. One of the most frustrating things I've ever... And I, I wanted to play... You know, ha, have you ever tried to... The more you tried to do something, the more you couldn't do it. And the more Anybody ever gets frustrated? Nobody ever get frustrated? I mean, and when you read the Word of God, it sounds so simple. But then, what I found out is you kind of need some coaching along the way. We need to do the things Jesus did, but we need to get out of the laboratory. and We need to get it into the workplace. Y'all listen. This is one of the things you're not going to like. Discipleship takes skill. It is the growing of skill. And some of you have accepted that you have a ceiling. You can never go beyond that ceiling. That's Satan trying to keep you down. There's a uniqueness that God has given you, a skill set and a desire. There is a purpose and a calling on your heart. And God wants you to grow into the fullness of that. You know, in our country, 200 years ago, Every person was given a trade, and you would go work in that trade and learn the trade. And you would become skilled in that trade, and you would become a master of that trade. Now we've become so smart that we just send you to school, and then after we send you to school, we send you out there on your own and throw you in the deep end of the water and just expect you to swim. How many of y'all have ever had a job that they just put you in it and you felt absolutely frustrated because you didn't know exactly what you were doing, but they just threw you in it? And that's what we do in the church. We get somebody saved and we give them a job and we just throw them in it. We don't ever train them. We don't ever give them any skill to, to learn how to do that. How many of you want to get in a <clears throat> go get in an airplane with a pilot who just read a book about it? No? As a matter of fact, I don't think they're going to let you sit in that chair until you're in that chair with somebody beside you mentoring you. And you have to be in so many hours in the air before you can ever fly solo. Are y'all good with that? And if you want to fly, fly just with instruments, there's a whole other category of learning you've got to learn. And for that, I say, that sounds smart. That sounds smart. Doctors have to go to school like everybody else. They've got to get a diploma from high school. Then they've got to get an, an, an associate. They've got to go, and, and, and then they go to medical school. And after medical school, they go to residency. And they have to work unbelievable hours for not very much pay before they can ever be, really be, become a doctor. And aren't you grateful that by the time they come to you, they've got some experience Make sense? See, so we take you wherever you are. 
Now look, there are some born geniuses out there. And they're going to they're gonna move faster down that road of learning than others. And you know what I say to that? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But once again, God created you uniquely. You're a snowflake. Nobody else is different. So what God gave me to do and what God gave you to do, though there may be similarities, you've got to find your uniqueness. Janice, there's no way I could ever play the piano like you. I've got a word. I'm not going to try. You know how much time and effort it would take me to learn to learn to do that? Well, number one, God never called me to that. I'm just grateful that God called her to that. And she doesn't just come up here and play. I have a feeling you've played a few times. As a matter of fact, this past week, she, we were talking about something Wednesday night when they ring those golden bells. And, and I wanted to break off singing it Wednesday night. And I almost broke off singing it right then. I love that song. But she went home and she played it. And she put it on Facebook. And to that, I said, beautiful. I praise God that she can do that. Look, you have yours. Rick, you're a very learned man. God has used that to where you can help others along the way. Deborah, you have a heart the size of the United States. You couldn't make that happen. God gave it to you. So you're going to work within those, those boundaries, but it has to be developed, or you will have unbelievable frustration and brokenness. Every person in here, God loves you just the way that you are. But God doesn't want you to stay just the way you are. God wants you to grow. God wants you to grow. Everything in life that is living is growing. Lastly, it's a team event. We think we can do it on our own. Since 1994, for some reason, God is, I, I got invited to help those with substance abuse. And I went and I spoke, and I, don't, I can't tell you how it worked. It was kind of like peanut butter and jelly. We just kind of fit together. And ever since then, I have understood that if God called me to a certain thing to help those, if there's something that can come out of my voice and out of my life that can be a blessing to others, I'll do that. But I, I, I love what they do when they come together. There's unbelievable honesty. They'll get in a small group, and they'll hold each other accountable. And if somebody's lying, somebody else will look at them. I mean, I would never say it, but somebody else will look at them and say, you're just full of it. You're just a liar. Because you can't con a con. Somebody who's been there, somebody who's done that, somebody who's got the scars from that, somebody who never wants to do it again, they can look at someone else and they can speak life into them. And I want to tell you, all of us need mentors. All of us need people that will join this life together that will help us along the way. You cannot grow into everything God wants you to be by yourself. You're not an island unto yourself. We need each other. There must be mentoring. There's a term, I'll talk more about this later, called synergy. We can do more together than we could ever do separately. You know the example that stuck in my, my mind? You take two horses. They can pull 9,000 pounds. That's four and a half tons. You take four horses. How much can they pull? I asked my teacher daughter this. She quickly said, well, they can nine tons. I said, no. Two can pull four and a half tons. Four can pull nine tons. You can do more together than you can do separately. Why is it that we need church? Well, I've been saved, and I can. I, I go to the to the church field of honey. I got a friend on Facebook. He says, "I'm going to turkey limit myself out." And I said, "Bless your heart." And he smells like liquor while he does it. And he's been through relationship after relationship after relationship. And job after job after job. And I love the guy to death. He's a great guy. But he never has tied into this that we need each other. You see, if 
we did it separately, we would grow frustrated. And we would say, what's the point? The job is too big. We can't, I can't do it alone. And that's right. You can't do it alone, but we can do it together. There's a synergy in the church. I don't know what it is that you're going through, but you may come to, to this place today just as low as you can be. There is a different feel over the church today. But I pray that when you're around someone, you can be encouraged and leave up here. Or you may come to the church that day and your heart may be up here. And you may need to be the one to, to help someone else out and lift them up. We can do more together. It's God's plan. I didn't create the church. He did. He wants us together. And you can kind of get the feel on how people feel about this particular false assumption by how much they give to church. They come and just show up and expect it just to, to ooze in. They, they, they sit by themselves, they talk to no one, and they leave quickly. And they've done their job. They're going to have a lonely week. And probably not a very productive week. We need each other. Please hear your pastor. We can do more together than we can do separately. You may not feel like you need it. You will. And if you will, you can come and be a part of that. Team matters. He had thousands that he preached to. He had hundreds who followed him. But the model of Christ was to pour into 12. That's the master's plan. And that group would hold each other accountable. But even in that, there was three, 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 and three. There was Peter, James, and John, who probably had more time with Jesus than all the others together. But that's okay. When, they, when he left them, they knew how to do what they were called to do. Is this different? Yes. Because the model of most churches is, let's get them saved. And then they're kind of on their own. They pick whatever small group, either by their age or just how they've chosen it, and we pretty much give them the chance to do that all on their own. We learn a lot of knowledge, but nobody is there to help us actually apply that knowledge. I don't think that's wise. Now, I've preached 35 minutes, and I need to hush. But hear your pastor's heart. I, I promise I'll try to do it in less than two minutes. <clears throat> Since 1988, I've been doing this every week. I've seen some great movements of God. And one of the things that we want is we want to have that spark of the Holy Spirit that comes through the church. And I've seen it. I've seen souls saved. I've seen lives changed. I really have. But here, your pastor, the frustrating thing for 32 years of ministry is how that kind of dwindles away. Instead of having synergy in the lives of the Christians, they'll do well and fade. There'll be a crisis in their life, and they'll do well and they'll fade. Now, I know some people who give themselves over to the Lord and to be discipled, who challenge themselves. But, and, and I know some that are always got a group of people that are trying to help each other. But for the most part, that doesn't happen. And for the most part, in churches, people come out of guilt, habit, turning over a new leaf, Or the flame of the Spirit of God. But yet it doesn't always last. And I will say, that's my fault. Not only my fault, but I'll take my responsibility there. Because discipleship's hard work. Making disciples of people. That takes time and energy. 
Is it important? I think you are very important. Do I want to see you grow? I think that's what would, it would make me ecstatic. Do I want to grow? Listen, I'm not preaching to you. I went and sat in a class for three hours this week. Because I need it. Not just preaching. I heard preaching too. Yes, I read books too. Yes, I, I, I talked to people about the Lord this week. Yes, I was trying to do ministry this week. But I also took time out for three hours of being discipled this week. Because I need it. And I'm just here to say, I, I don't know how well this is going to go over, but I'm trying to share with you there are some things that's, that are very easy for us to understand that we just assume that because we're saved, we're going to heaven one day, that's all i got to do. And it's not. We take the love of God, we take the life of God, and we share it. We live it. Now, I don't know where you are on your journey, but you're either in a storm, you've just come out of a storm, or there's one around the corner, and I want you to be prepared. If you were to ask me, I would say the worst thing that the church has done is we have failed in discipleship. Church, there's a reason we're doing these core values. It's not just the core value of the church as a whole. These five should be the core values of us individually. So I'm going to do the invitation a little differently today. I'm not going to ask the praise team to come up. I'm going to ask Janice to come. Brother Mark, you come up. But I want you to start thinking about you and your personal walk with God. If you were to grade your, yourself, are you uh, in preschool in the application of the Word of God in your life? Are you in elementary school, middle school, high school? You judge yourself. Are you in college? Are you in higher learning? Are you in specialized school like the doctor has to go to med school? Are you in residency? Are you a practicing physician? Are you seeking to raise up new leaders? Because that's the only way that we can continue to the next generation is raising up leaders behind us. We can't live and walk away and go to heaven and leave a desperate need behind us. I want you to grade yourself. Now, don't feel doomed. No, 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 don't feel doomed. That's a wake-up call. I don't care where you are in your journey. God's not through with you. He wants to use you. So go from where, you can't change yesterday. So go from where you are. Change tomorrow by changing your today. There's some things that we're going to be calling you to do as a church. There's some opportunities that we're going to lay before you. You see, it's my fault if I do not put the discipleship things in front of you to help you along the way. You just have to decide whether you're going to be part of that or not. By the way, your pastor's going to love you either way. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want you to think back to the time when you got saved. I want you to remember the place, how you felt, what you did. Remember how ready you were to serve Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you've probably felt that same feeling many times in your life. Where are you today? Right now, where are you? Nobody else will judge you. Just listen to your heart. Listen to the Lord. Please do not put a ceiling there. All authority has been given to Christ, and he has yielded that to us. What does God want to do in your life? One of my verses that I love so very much is Ephesians 4.20. Now unto him, that is Christ, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think.
Are you ready to begin the journey afresh and anew? I'm not asking you to make a commitment today to something that you'll forget this afternoon. I'm asking you right now to make a commitment to yield to the Lord that He can do whatever He wants. It's not your will that will make it happen. It's the Lord that makes it happen. So Father, speak to your people. Call them to yourself. These are some great people, Lord. You love them so very much. Lord, grow them up. Use them, Lord. Help them. Strengthen them. Teach them, Lord, to observe all things. Lord, I know it's a daunting task. But strengthen them. Right now in your spirit, right now, would you just yield your heart to the Lord? Lord, I don't know how, but I desire to. Help me become what I need to be. Did you do that? Have you yielded that? Have you given your heart to the Lord?